Good morning, class. Thanks for joining me again for another lecture. Today, we're going to do lecture 19 from the big picture of scripture. And today, we're going to look at Exodus 1 through 15, which is uh, the story of Moses and the beginning of the story of the Exodus. And we're going to be looking at the close context, the immediate or the textual context of this these passages. And it's a lot to absorb. It's a very important part of the Bible. It deserves a lot more than one lecture. But uh, because this is the big picture of Scripture, we're keeping it at a high level, and we're focusing on, on kind of tracing the covenants throughout the Bible. This lecture is titled Through the Sea, and I'm borrowing that lecture title from one of the passages or one of the section headings from Christ from Beginning to End, Hunter and Wellum. And we're going to jump into it. So let me let me share my screen, and we'll get after it. So as I mentioned, it's uh, the beginning of the book of Exodus. And I want to kind of talk a little bit about the Mosaic Covenant. That's what we're going to be working on is getting into is the Mosaic Covenant. And just to kind of uh, point that to where we find that in the Bible, we're, we're going to find that starting with Exodus. But just to even step back a step further, if we remember the first five books of the Bible have a couple different names that they are often referred to as. One is a uh, Torah, which is a Hebrew word that's translated to instruction or teaching or ultimately the term law. And the, the the Hebrew word Torah, you'll often hear the first five books of the Bible that were authored by Moses uh, refer to them as the Torah. Another term that we might hear it is the Pentateuch. That's a Greek term that means five books, the first five books of the Bible. Or sometimes we'll just hear the English term law. As I mentioned, Torah is translated to law. And so when we look at the Torah, we're going to actually see several of the, the biblical covenants here in these first five books. In the book of Genesis, you can see in yellow, I've highlighted the books, and in blue, I've highlighted the covenants. In Genesis, we actually see the Adamic, Noahic, and Abrahamic covenant all in the first book of the Bible. Sometimes the Adamic and Noahic are called the covenant with creation, or sometimes they're referred to as specifically separately as Adamic and Noahic covenants. But then we see the Abrahamic covenant. And we see the book of Genesis kind of closing at the end of the Abrahamic covenant. And and, uh, and we see the book of Exodus opening with the Mosaic covenant. So the books of Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy is all kind of are pertinent to the Mosaic covenant. And we're going to see that, that Hunter and Wellam focus primarily on the book of Exodus. And so we're going to do that too. But that said, all of these books really are pertinent to the Mosaic covenant. Though we see the Mosaic Covenant established in Exodus, we, we see the books of Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy kind of uh, fulfilling and filling out the details of the Mosaic Covenant. And though these books do are written in, in a certain chronological order, they're not really established that way. They're more written topically. And we see the book of Exodus kind of being the introduction to the, this section of the Bible, but the books of Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy overlap that book of Exodus. In fact, I looked at an old uh, textbook that I have, a survey of the Old Testament by Andrew Hill and John Walton, and I just wanted to share with you kind of a quick description of these four books of the Bible. Uh, according to them, they, they provide a purpose statement for each of these books, and let me just read what they share. The purpose of Exodus is to explain how the Israelites became slaves in Egypt and their deliverance from the Egyptian oppression. The book also reveals the God whose name is Yahweh and relates uh, and how he relates his divine presence uh, and how, it, how his divine presence came to dwell among his people Israel. So rather, let me restate that. The purpose of Exodus is to explain how the Israelites became slaves in Egypt and how they were delivered from the Egyptian oppression and also how the God whose name is Yahweh uh, relates his divine presence and comes to dwell among his people Israel. Leviticus, his uh, purpose is to provide a manual or a handbook of holiness designed to instruct the Hebrew community in holy worship and holy living so that they might imitate God's holiness and enjoy the presence and blessing of God. In Numbers, we see a contrast of the faithfulness of God with the faithlessness and rebellion of Israel. God's faithfulness can be observed by the census. Uh, what we see here is that there was more Israelites 
when they re when they arrived after 40 years of wandering in the desert in the promised land than there was when they left Egypt. So despite the fact that Israel was grumbling um, and went through some very difficult times in the desert and in a dry and, you know, difficult land, God was faithful and they still prospered even in the wilderness wandering. We can see God's, uh, we can see Israelites' faithlessness in the fact that they grumbled and that they disobeyed God at every turn. Ultimately, the people of God uh, tested God at every turn while God continued to provide for their every need. And then Deuteronomy is summarized to review the covenant in preparation for entering the promised land. It's the charter document for Israel that emphasized one God, one people, uh, one people of God, one sanctuary, and one law. So these books kind of work together to kind of show the trajectory of Scripture from the time that they left Egypt to the time they entered the Promised Land, that 40 years. And in that time, it shows kind of how God established himself, filled out the uh, the details of the Abrahamic covenant into a new covenant, the Mosaic covenant, that didn't replace it, but filled out the details, continued it, and developed it to be more clear exactly how God was going to dwell with his people and how he was going to work with his people. And so... What we're going to see here is uh, it's important to know that Exodus needs to be looked at in context, just like everything in the Bible. And so the Mosaic Covenant is best understood in, in context. We have the closed context, the continuing context, the complete con context, the covenantal, you know, as I mentioned, rather than continuing, we can call it continuing or covenantal or complete or canonical context. But when we look at God's covenant with creation, or when we look, I'm sorry, at the Mosaic Covenant, we want to understand it in light of the covenants that preceded it, that it continues. God had the covenant with creation. He he had the Adamic and Noahic covenant. Man was created good, but man rebelled. Sin has consequences. Namely, the biggest consequence of sin is death. But there's still a hope. We see that in Exodus 3.15, the Proto-Evangelium, the first hint of the gospel that, that, the, that the descendant of Eve would crush the head of the serpent. Man continues to rebel, but God continues to remain faithful. We see in the Abrahamic covenant, we see that God promised Abraham that he would have land, descendants, and blessings. Um, and then we, when we look at now the Mosaic covenant, the Mosaic covenant should be found in context, should be understood in context of the Adamic covenant and of the Abrahamic covenant and of the Noahic covenant so that it's a continuation of God's work in, in, in establishing his people, his chosen people, and revealing himself and reconciling those people to himself. Hunter and Wellam break down the close context of Exodus into three sections. We have Exodus 1 through 15, Exodus 16 through 24, and then Exodus 25 through 40. There's a few different ways that you could you could uh, make an outline for Exodus, but we're going to go with Hunter and Wellam's uh, sections, and today we're going to look through the sea, the first section, Exodus 1 through 15, through the sea, and that explains from the time that that Moses uh, was born until the time through the parting of the Red Sea, Exodus 1 through 15. So I want to kind of start with a few observations. Uh, in the first part, Israel is increasing in number, and Moses' life is spared. So in is when we left off at the end of Genesis, there was about 70 members of the family of Jacob, whose name was changed to Israel, that that were that moved from the land of Canaan, where Abraham had established their family. They moved to Egypt. Joseph had been sold into slavery by his brothers an evil deed but god used what they meant for evil for good and when joseph went into egypt he found favor and he established himself very high in the government and he was a very powerful person in the in the egyptian government god blessed him with favor and in turn blessed the egyptians that when they when they promoted uh when pharaoh promoted uh, joseph egypt did well and he continued to promote him until he had a very high office in government so when there was a famine in Egypt and Joseph's family, or I'm sorry, uh, yeah, Joseph's family, uh, Israel's family, Jacob's family, came to see, to Egypt to beg for food, to, to find provision. They found Joseph, they reconciled with Joseph, and Joseph uh, had 
had uh, mercy upon his family and let them come back to Israel and set up a, a, a land for them called the land of Goshen. And in that land, uh, they prospered. There was about 70 people in his family that, that went into that land. And now we pick up in the book of Exodus 1 about 400 years later. And now things have changed in many ways. And the, on the good side, things changed that his family had prospered. That 70 people has now turned to anywhere from 30 or 40,000 to maybe as many as one to two million people. It's hard to know because there's some words in Exodus that have multiple meanings. So, for example, there's a word that can be translated to either be thousand or clan. And so there's a big differentiation between what scholars think. I I'll personally tend to believe there was a lot of people, probably more like a million or more um, uh, Egyptian, or I'm sorry, Israelites in Egypt. But even if it was 30, 40, 50, 100,000, 200,000, that's still a very, very large number. So I certainly believe that the Bible is accurate. I just think the interpretation of that word is unclear. And so for that, we we have to know that there was just many people that have that were in, in uh, Israelites in Egypt. So uh, Joseph's family came to Egypt. There's anywhere from 70 to about 70 to start with to now. There's many, many more. Uh, 400 years later, the Egyptian kings had changed. And at this point, uh, a king had taken over who didn't respect or know Joseph and the history of Israel and Egypt and how Israel was a blessing to Egypt. And he began to fear Israel and, and saw them as a potential um, opponent, as a uh, as a threat to his power. And he enslaved Israel and began to treat them harshly, put work over them that was unreasonable and, and treated them with harsh conditions to the point where he even ended up uh, announcing an edict that the Hebrew midwives were to kill the firstborn sons to, to limit their ability to procreate, to reproduce, to, to gain in power, to keep them under oppression. And in doing so, uh, Obviously, there was, you know, a, a great threat to Israel, but God, God spared Israel. In Moses, uh, he used Moses. Moses was born to a, a Israelite mother, a Hebrew woman, and instead of being killed, his mother took care of him for three months and then ultimately put him in a basket in the Nile River. And Pharaoh's daughter uh, found him and rescued him, and she ended up adopting him into her family and raised him as a prince, raised him as royalty, as an adopted son. <clears throat> Moses, as he grew up, ended up as a young adult, got into an altercation, and he ended up killing an Egyptian man, and that caused him to flee to Midian. In Exodus 2 through 4, we see that God remembers his promises. This is an important theme that I wanted to kind of point out. But if we look at Exodus 2... Sorry, let me turn there in my Bible. I should have done that. If we look at Exodus 2, we see that God remembers his promises. Well, 400 years before that, more than 400 years before that, God had promised Abraham that he was going to make him a mighty nation. And then ultimately, he revealed to Abraham that his people would be enslaved, but he would lead them out of slavery. And now in here in Exodus 2, 23, we can see these verses. During those many days, the king of Egypt died, and the people of Israel groaned because of their slavery and cried out for help. Their cry for rescue from slavery came up to God, and God heard their groaning, and God remembered his covenant with Abraham. Sorry, right now. God remembered his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob. God saw the people of Israel, and God knew. Then we see that God reveals himself to Moses in Midian, and he reveals himself in the burning bush, the bush that starts on fire but doesn't get consumed by the fire. And, and Ab Moses is deathly afraid of what's happening. And God reveals himself to Moses and says in Genesis 3, 6, that he's the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He promised to use Moses to lead his people out of slavery in Egypt and to the land that he had promised. And, and if we look at Genesis 3, 13 through 17, we see some key verses then Moses said to God, if I come to the people of Israel and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they ask me, what is his name? What shall I say to them? And God said to Moses, I am who I am. This is an amazing verse. He, he describes himself in such a unique way. I am who I am. 
like giving the idea that words aren't enough to describe who he is, or he is all things. And he says to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, say this to the people of Israel, I am has sent me to you. God also said to Moses, say this to the people of Israel, the Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. So we see to him as relating to them as the God of their forefathers. This is my name forever, and thus I am to be remembered throughout all generations. Go and gather the elders of Israel together and say to them, The Lord God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob has appeared to me, saying, I have observed you and what has been done to you in Egypt, and I promise you that I will bring you up out of the affliction of Egypt to the land of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites, a land flowing with milk and honey. So God is a God that remembers his promises. And so God uh, uses Moses, and he uses his brother Aaron, and he gives Moses powerful signs. He gives Moses the ability to throw his staff to the ground and for it to turn into a serpent. He gives him the ability to take his hand and put it into his cloak and pull it out withered and leprous and put it back in his cloak and pull it out, and it would be well. And, and he uses these signs to give authority to Moses, to, to, to prove the authority that he's given to Moses to the people around him, both to the people of Israel and to the Egyptians, and especially to Pharaoh. Moses and Aaron go on to confront Pharaoh and insist that they that Pharaoh allows their people to leave slavery in Egypt and, and to go on. And Pharaoh ultimately hardens his own heart, and God hardens Pharaoh's heart. And that's a, a whole teaching in and of itself, but for sake of, of the course and the big picture, we're going to continue to move on. But he, he uses 10 plagues to, to both show his power, that being God, and also to ultimately unfold the plan of, of forcing Pharaoh to let the Egyptians to go. And so that is kind of the second theme that I want to point out in, in Exodus is the theme of God's sovereign power. In Genesis 7 through 10, he uses 10 plagues, and I've listed the first nine here. And I looked at a, a website called Zondervan Academic, where there's an article about what the plagues might be telling us about the Egyptian gods. <clears throat> Certainly set aside the idea of the, the correlation between the plagues and the Egyptian gods. Just the plagues in themselves is amazing power. God turns the Nile River in Africa to blood. He, he brings forth plagues of frogs and lice and flies and dead livestock and boils and hail in the desert and all kinds of things like the three days of darkness. He just proves that he is all powerful, that he has power over all of nature and beyond. And so God demonstrates his sovereign power, both to the people of Israel and of course, to the Egyptians, his oppressors. Excuse me. But in these plagues, we also see sort of another, another observation that many scholars have made, that these plagues actually correspond to Egyptian gods. We can't necessarily say exactly what was in God's mind in the corresponding of the plagues to the Egyptian gods, but it seems like an important observation. The Egyptians, um, for example, worship a god of the Nile River, but God turned the Nile River into blood showing that he was he was the true God and that that God of the Nile River was a false God, was a, a made up in man's mind, that he had the power, that the, he, that the God of the Nile River um, had no, no power compared to God, the one true and actual real God. Um, same can be said of all these other situations. If you look at this list here, you know, there's, uh, there's Ray, the sun God. Uh, we can see that God brought darkness. And, you know, what would that say about the sun god that Egypt worshipped? The, the god who brought light, God brought darkness. Wouldn't that show that the god, the one true god who brought this plague, has power over any other false gods that the Egyptians have made up in their minds? And so that's one of the things that we see through the ten plagues is that God has the sovereign power. The Bible is, exists to bring God glory. The trajectory of Scripture, all creation exists to bring glory to God. He won't be thwarted of his glory. He won't have his glory taken by some false, made-up, man-made gods. And so here we see God using these ten plagues to, to demonstrate his sovereign power both to Israel and to the world. 
Then we ultimately see the tenth plague, and the tenth plague is is where we really see this beautiful uh, and horrible scenario. We see the reality, the horribleness of it, which is that the the wages of sin is death. If you remember from Genesis. And so because of the the sin of the Egyptians and of the Israelites, God put a plague on all of Egypt, and he brought the plague that would be death. He brought the plague that would be that the firstborn would be dead, the firstborn of everybody in the land of Egypt, not just the Egyptians, but also the Israelites. In the previous plagues, God spared Israel of some of the plagues, and some of the plagues only affected, they only affected the Egyptians and not the Israelites. The land of Goshen was that territory that was carved out of Egypt, set aside for the Israelites. And and for example, in the plague where darkness came across the land for three days, there was light in the land of Goshen. And so this plague, however, the 10th plague would be indiscriminate. It would affect everybody. It would be affect everybody in Egypt. That would be the firstborn of every clan, of every family, of every home. That would be the firstborn of even the livestock. They would all be wiped out by the angel of death. The angel of the Lord would come through and and bring destruction to them. God made a special provision for Israel, though, just as he did for Isaac. And and in this provision, he demonstrates redemption and substitution. And I'm going to read from from Hunter and Wellam, starting at about the middle of page 132, that kind of puts this into... Uh, so it's just written very well, and I'd like to share that as part of this lecture. Israel's rescue from Egypt, though required more than God's judgment on Egypt. That night, the angel of death was non-discriminatory in his work of killing. He passed through the land and brought judgment upon every firstborn, regardless of who they were, whether Egyptian or Israelite. There was nothing special to save Israel. They would need more to escape the judgment than had fallen upon Egypt. They also needed deliverance from God's judgment on their own sin. Yet just as God had provided for Isaac on the mountain, he now provides for Israel. That very night, God instructed Moses to tell the Israelites to slay lambs and mark each household's doorpost with the lamb's blood. The angel of death would pass over the homes whose doorposts were marked, not because they were Israelites, but because of the blood. That's an important distinction. Why the blood? The blood represented both the death of a lamb in the place of the firstborn and the faith of those who marked their homes, trusting God's promise. In this way, God's judgment came upon Egypt, but God's salvation came to Israel. To all those who took God at his word, that night the Lord saved his people from death through death by his own gracious provision. This event was called the Passover. Finally, God led his people in an escape from Egypt during the night. That night, Israel ate in haste, their sandals tied, ready at God's command to flee. When Pharaoh gave the word of their release, they made their exit. Yet, as Israel approached the Red Sea, they faced two obstacles, the sea ahead and Pharaoh's army behind, coming to destroy them. What was Israel to do? Nothing. Which is God's design. God will deliver his people by demonstrating his own incomparably great power. God settled a cloud between Pharaoh's army and Israel and commanded Moses to stretch out his hand. The Lord split the sea in two and Israel crossed safely on dry ground between the walls of water. Pharaoh's army foolishly followed and God brought the waters down. All this shows that God's power is unrivaled. Israel not is unrivaled. Israel not only escaped from Egypt, but also brought with them much wealth. They plundered the Egyptians just as God promised Abraham, I will punish the nations they serve as slaves, the nation they serve as slaves, and afterward they will come out with great possessions. So he's looking back on Genesis 15, and he said to Abraham, I will punish the nation they serve as slaves, and afterward they will come out with great possessions. Such was God's marvelous plan. He rescued Israel and displayed his glory. So this is a wonderful book, and I hope that you're reading it closely. But what we're seeing here is through these 10 plagues and then this final plague that God is showing the themes of redemption and substitution. And if we just looked at Oxford Dictionary's definitions, substitution is the action of replacing something or someone with another person or another thing. So the lamb died in the place of the firstborn of the families of Israel. 
it wasn't a question of did God spare the firstborn? He spared the firstborn in the event if the if that house had the blood of the lamb spread spread on the doorpost and the lentil, the overhang of the door. It's the blood that spared. It's not the ethnicity that spared. It was the blood that spared and the faith to follow God's command. And it also shows redemption, the action of saving or being saved from sin or error or evil, the action of gaining or gaining possession of something in exchange for payment or clearing a debt. So we see that God cleared the debt of sin. Here, God cleared the debt of the Israelites' sin by the blood of the Lamb. The blood of the Lamb was sacrificed in substitution, and that thus it redeemed that firstborn son of Israel. The firstborn son of Israel was set to be killed, but because the blood of the lamb was put in place as its substitute, the lamb was put in place as its substitute, that firstborn was redeemed or saved, saved away from what was its fate. Pharaoh let Israel go with all the possessions, and then they pursued them. So Pharaoh realized in horror that, that his own son was dead, that the firstborn sons of all of Egypt were dead. Great shrieking came across the land, and they let Israel go, only then for God to harden Pharaoh's heart again, and they pursued after them. And they pursued after them, and Israel fled from Egypt. And when, when the Egyptian army was close to catching up to them, God put a cloud to, dis to, to uh, disturb them and to allow Israel time to escape. And when Israel came to the Red Sea, they were stuck. There was nowhere to go. But God led Moses to part the Red Sea. And ultimately, Israel pursued, or uh, Egypt pursued Israel right into the Red Sea. And just in time for Israel to escape to the other side, God closed the waters up, drowning all of Israel or all of Egypt and sparing Israel. So it was just a miraculous set of events from saving Moses at the beginning of this story to going and uh, preparing Moses and then calling Moses to confront Pharaoh and lead his people out of Egypt. Then from there, uh, God brought plagues to, to force Pharaoh to relent and allow Israel to leave and also to demonstrate his power both to Israel and to the rest of the world. And then Israel ultimately escaped by God providing the 10th plague, which was a horrific plague of death the consequence of sin, and then in, in sparing Israel with a provision, with a special provision of the sacrificial lamb that would be made to be sacrificed in place of the firstborn of Israel. And we can kind of see as we go here, we're going to see how God used that. God instituted a feast to remember it called the Passover, to remember how the angel of the Lord passed over these homes of the Israelites and saved them and how he rescued them out of Egypt and how he made provision for them in the desert, ultimately, which we're going to get to next. So I'm going to conclude this with just a quick uh, statement of prayer. And in coming, in the next two lectures, we're going to cover the rest of the book of Exit in its immediate context, in looking at what the text is actually saying. Then we're going to circle back and look at the entire books of Exodus from the continuing and then ultimately the canonical context pointing to Christ. And we see that all this Passover and these plagues and everything all point to Jesus Christ. So, Lord, we thank you for this time. We thank you for your word. I pray that that these uh, students would be able to grasp the big picture of your word here and be able to really grow from it. And I pray that you'd apply it to their lives so that they could know you better, God, that they could understand the salvation that you brought them and the great cost at which it which it came and, and the great glory from which you do because of it, Lord. And I pray that you'd help us to have hearts of gratitude, open our eyes to be able to see, open every student and mine um, hearts to be able to receive your word, Lord, and, and open our mouths to be able to share it with those around us who don't know you, God, who don't know what hope there is in you and in your son, Christ. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.